As we look through the teachings of Bethel, on this segment, what we're going to be diving into is the teachings or the prayer group known as Sozo Prayer and how they instill this into those at Bethel and how it's moving along in a number of churches all over the world. And we want to check out, is this biblical whatsoever? And if it's not, what spirit is it of? Stay with us on the third installment of Bethel or Beth Hell. From someone who is still here at Bethel, I can attest to the fact that they are preaching a false gospel. In a vision, Jesus picks me up and he says, please forgive me. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. We make a mistake in thinking he is in control of everything. Our authority, our will, has an effect on what happens around us. Ye is big G, and you are little G. You're little G, God. Thank you for joining us once again for the third installment of our examination of Bethel. And with me today, as he has been for the other episodes as well, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Excited to be here. Great to be here as well, Chad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And on this installment, we're going to be specifically looking at what is known through Bethel as Sozo prayer. And to give you an idea, I just want to tell you a quick story of the first time I had ever heard of Sozo prayer. In fact, when it came to Bethel as a whole, it was when I began researching the entire movement because I had a friend at a wrestling tournament who said, hey, I'm a believer in Christ. I, I love Jesus. And I said, great, great to meet you. Got to know him a little bit. And apparently his father is a pastor, his mother is a quote-unquote pastor, and he told me that they're really involved in this Sozo prayer. In fact, his dog was named Sozo. And so I said, what on earth is Sozo prayer? And I said, well, well what is that? I'm, I'm really not certain what that is. And I had heard of Bethel because, of course, their music and Jesus culture and things like this, but I'd really not delved into them. And when he told me that what he would do is get sat down by his father and his brother and they would ask him in the dark, who are you praying to? Is it the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? Who do you want to pray to today? I said, oh, well, that's not biblical, you know? And I had a nice conversation with him, but sadly enough, that is the movement that they were involved in. And I said, what is Sozo? And I began researching it. And I'm going to read a little bit from their own mission statement, from this basic Sozo DVD, because people are paying a lot of money, Joe, to have this installment into their churches, to have this, yeah. this Sozo prayer, which as we're going to, uh, you know, unclothe this thing, we're going to see that Sozo prayer is not even, it's not even that it's not found in scripture. Worse off yet, it's found in other new age tactics. And this is what it says, on their own mission statement, it says, Our mission statement is to provide gentle yet powerful deliverance in a safe and honoring atmosphere in which the Godhead is allowed to direct our means of ministering. You will understand that when we teach you the, quote, Father Ladder, when we talk about the Godhead, most people, when we ask, Who do you pray to? God? Okay, that's a good place to start. But we're going to teach you to use the tool for the entire aspect of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Just as a quick question, Joe, when we pray, should we be asking which part of the triune Godhead we should be praying to? Well, I think it's a very interesting question, and it's ironic, brother, because you remember in one of the last episodes we had done, we talked about how Bill Johnson, the head of this Bethel movement, and uh, Vlatin, his protege, how they both emphasize wanting to have the mantle, the spiritual mantle of who? William Branham, William Branham. Yeah. who said the, tri the Trinitary, the Trinity is from the devil. There is no triune Godhead. So we have a huge contradiction here because according to him, there's just Jesus. 
There's no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's just kind of an inherent contradiction. If you want this spiritual mantle that he had that calls the Trinity of the devil, yet you have a ministry that claims to be seeking different parts of the Trinity uh, to heal you. And you know, Jesus said, and it's just, it's trying to have a corner and trying to create a niche to where people feel that they need you and you have some special insight and it's your insight that will help them spiritually because you see something that nobody else has seen before. And Jesus said that we should, that we're to uh, ask the Father in his name. He specifically told us how to pray. You don't see prayers really to the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Uh, you certainly don't see calling angels as they also teach. A lot of the things they teach, sucking bones or soaking bone or power from dead bodies. A lot of strange teachings. This is another thing you don't see. You do see in the scripture, going to the Father in the name of Jesus. There's a few times here and there where you see uh, prayers to Jesus uh, throughout the scripture. So I, have, I don't have a hard time when somebody uh, prays to Jesus. I've cried out to the Lord Jesus and I cry out normally to the Father in the name of Jesus. Our Father, he taught us, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I pray to be strengthened by his Holy Spirit. I don't pray to the Holy Spirit, though I pray to the Father that he'd strengthen me by his spirit and so forth. So uh, there, it's just, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, but it gets pretty strange. But no, that's not biblical. What they're doing is they're trying to say, hey, we're gonna have, teach you how to relate to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in th three different aspects of your prayer life to heal your fragmentation. And what's the irony here is they're creating a fragmentation in our prayer life to heal your fragmentation. That's a, that's a really interesting point. And something I've always thought when it came to prayer was that even in our prayer life, the Trinity is real. For me personally, when I see what the scriptures teach in, in Romans 8, that I don't even know what to pray, but that the Holy Spirit with great utterance that, you yeah. know, that words can't muster, yeah. you know, that he would pray through us and that our mediator is Jesus Christ. Amen. And then I pray directly to the Father. Amen. It, it's I see the Trinity at work in my prayer life, and Absolutely. this is not something where I'm asking which one can I speak to. And it's to. beautiful. Yeah. But it becomes really strange when you decide you're going to play favorites. And when it comes to strange, that is exactly what Sozo seems to be. Now they try to make the argumentation that Sozo is this Greek word used in the New Testament concerning salvation. And what Sozo does, in as we'll get to the fragmenting and the, 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 you know, the, the divine editing and all the things that we're going to get into regarding this ministry, so-called, one of the things that I find really, really interesting is they believe that when somebody is saved or has salvation, Sozo, then that means it should be an entire healing, like it's this whole package of healing. So do you have anything to say about that, the fact that the healing should also take place in the salvation in that way as well. Well, there's a lot of debate in regard to the atonement as far as what is there healing in the atonement, you know? And we're not, we don't have time to get into that debate. Uh, most people that enter into that debate do believe that total healing, including our bodily resurrection in the future, is a result of what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, I would take issue with somebody who said, no, that's just some kind of separate deal. Obviously, the effects of what Jesus did our have ramifications not only for our spiritual salvation but our resurrection and even uh, the new heaven and new earth all of creation grows to be delivered is through his atonement he died for our sins but the effect of what he did in allowing us to be resurrected and enter into a new heaven and earth is is beautiful but what they do a lot of the charismatics do and we do believe in the gifts as well but i should say a lot of those that are involved in charismania uh, what they do is they say it should happen right now in fact, that's why Bill Johnson teaches that he claims that you should always be healed. If you're not healed, it's because, you know, because Jesus died for our sins, but he also died to make us whole. And he, he died, uh, you know, by his stripes, we're physically healed. So if you're not physically healed and you're, you die of, you're dying of cancer or something like that, he'll blame you not having the faith or the sin in your life, or what have you. Or he said in the past that uh, everybody should be healed, you know, that there's healing and atonement, atonement. So uh, this goes into the inner healing that Sozo teaches, which is an old heresy in the church. It's been around for a few decades now, where uh, that you should have these inner heal this inner healing going on too. And it's interesting because we do believe in the here and now that there is inner healing available through the gospel, through the word of God, through reading God's word, the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin, this process of sanctification whereby he turns us away from sin to where we ask for forgiveness and we're accepted in the beloved and, and we're thankful to God and he transforms our heart and makes us more and more like Christ and, and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, through, through following what is written in the scripture and the Bible says not go beyond, beyond what's written, 
What they're doing is going, they're going beyond what's written. And you need to get into their very, just very meticulous, specific type of inner healing to actually experience healing the way God wants it. And it's interesting. Wow, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Jesus, they never taught this. So were they missing something for 2,000 years? It's absolutely ridiculous when you think about it. And you know what, it, it, to me, it's, it becomes kind of sickening again. Why? Because the irony is so thick when I look at this whole movement. Because the irony is that they claim to be so in touch with the power of God and healing, yet they lack it so much that they're seeking grave soaking. They're seeking calling angels. They're seeking sozo. They're seeking all, they're basically running again to all these broken cisterns, these dry wells that aren't delivering because if you, because they're not experiencing often in, in many cases, true salvation. When you have true salvation, you don't have to go into a bunch of inner healing for years. And your whole life is about, you know, dealing with something that happened in the past. You're digging it up. And Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. Reaching forward to those things that are ahead. Yet they're camping on the things that are behind. And what happens is you need experts in sozo healing so you can actually be sanctified. And it basically becomes part of a false gospel. Because now I can't be healed unless I submit myself to Sozo or to what really is rooted in Agnes Sanford. I'm sure we'll get into her a little bit. Yeah. Agnes Sanford's teaching in inner healing. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And the founders of this movement or this this I hate calling it a ministry because it's not a ministry. <laughs> but tough. the the fact is is the founders of this are Steve and Donna De Silva. And they have this idea that this is, you know, some form of biblical Christianity. And they're, they're positing it this way. And in their advanced teaching, they're going to talk about one of the ways. And this, guys, this isn't just us grabbing clips. This is from the Bethel store. And this is how the advanced teaching of Sozo. We're going to play a clip of exactly how this works. A lot of times um, I get pictures on you know how, how God talks to you. Maybe you hear a word, maybe you see a picture, maybe you see a color. I've actually asked people, does blue mean anything to you? You know, because they're not owning anything yet, you're not sure how to get started, it's not working. They're like, Yeah, I think that's revelation. And they just go on and, and, and it's like then you get your opening. Then you get your opening into it. You just say a random color and you get them involved. And think about this. I, I, I want to put this in perspective. Was that chapter four? Yeah. Is that what she's quoting, Chad? <laughs> no. And the interesting part is when you look at it and you hear that statement, this is on the Bethel Store's advanced training. This is the advanced training yeah. because what takes place typically during a Sozo spiritual. prayer, yeah. 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 and ter- during a Sozo prayer, is one person with two people, the trainers of the opposite sex, and they say it usually takes about three hours. When they first started, it would take like six hours that they would be drawing this stuff out. And so this is how she's initiating them, by throwing out a color and asking, hey, the color blue. And I'm like, wow, that's a shirt Joe's wearing today. I can't believe it. I have this uh, revelation. Uh, synchronicity. And But you look at it and you say, what is this? What is going yeah. on? Is this some sort of for, form of prophecy? Is this a biblical prophecy, Joe? Well, you know, I think we're going to get into some of what they call divine editing. And to me, it's like Scientology's auditing. You need Scientology. Oh, yeah. You need to be hooked up by these two wires to these little tomato cans, or the cans they used to use. Got a little bit more sophisticated. And you need Scientologists to take you through your past and everything else and so you can be whole. And it's the same kind of thing. It's like, no, you need editors or divine editors and that practice sozo. And what you've done, you've, you've deviated from the scripture and you've gotten into just a form of emptiness. And not only just emptiness, it can open you up to occult powers, yeah. which we'll talk about as we go on as well. Yeah, it's interesting because there was something that I had studied called the Barnum Effect. And the Barnum Effect is the tendency to accept certain information as true, such as character assessments or horoscopes, and even with the information because it's so vague as to be worthless. And that, that's, a, that's yeah. a fact. And this is exactly what happened. Is this blue or here? Did you get a word from the Lord? And, and just like earlier in the first segment, when we went over the false prophecies that not only are allowed at Bethel, but required at Bethel, required false prophecy. And you have them having these required false prophecies. You have them using the Barnum effect and just throwing out darts on a dartboard. And then hopefully one hits. And you're like, this is not biblical. When you see the Old Testament prophets, what do you see them say? Thus saith the Lord. Not maybe, not kinda, Amen, bro. not blue, thus 
saith the Lord. And, and, it, and it is really dangerous. And you may be thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, but th- maybe they mean well and it's not too bad. But I'm telling you, as you're going to hear in this next clip, it is scary where this can take you because right. it can take you to a place that is heretical. And so for me, that was very hard growing up. And um, through the sozo, I began to understand that I had a lot of resentment toward God because of my father's death. And um, in the sozo, they led me through a prayer of forgiveness where I forgave God. Yes, did you hear that? She said that she was led in a sozo prayer to forgive God because if you read the, watch the rest of the video, because her father had died. And maybe you're thinking right now, well, this is just one person. Maybe they didn't understand. Well, then why did Bethel put it on their website to promote Sozo prayer? But nonetheless, even if that was your excuse, the fact is, is that this isn't just one person getting involved with this movement. In fact, this has bled, this idea of Sozo prayer has bled all the way into the pulpit, as you're going to hear from Seth Dahl. And one time I was laying on the floor, actually it was in this room, I'm laying on the floor, and in in a vision, in an encounter with God, in a vision, Jesus picks me up and holds me so close that I can't see anything, and he holds me so close, and Jesus starts to weep, and he says, please forgive me, please forgive me. So, so far, in, at Bethel, it seems like the Holy Spirit is a blue genie. Mm-hmm. Jesus needs to be forgiven. And so does the Father. Yeah. Is there anywhere in Scripture that we see that we, even if it was symbolically, even if it was metaphorically, some way, any way that you see in the Bible that we need to forgive God in any way? No, uh, quite the opposite, Chad. Uh, it's... Uh the scriptures replete and just teeming with God's attributes and the perfections of God's attributes and that it's impossible for God to lie, for instance. Uh, the Bible says God cannot be tempted. Uh, he can't be even tempted to do something wrong because he's perfect. And this is, this is utter, and it really breaks my heart. It gets me a little bit upset too because they're besmirching the holy and beautiful character of our creator who loves us so much that we're the sinners, we're the rotten ones that he had to give himself for to save us. If he was going to save us without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He gave himself for us because of our sin. And to come out of these sozo sessions with the idea that there's something wrong with God and I have to forgive him, all of a sudden we become righteous and he becomes the sinner. It shows you how demonic this is, is because what's happening is they're turning people away from the scripture you can't look at the mirror of God's word. The Bible compares it, the word to a mirror. When you look at the mirror of his word, he reveals his holiness, and it's a mirror, and it shows us when we see our heart, it shows us our fallenness and our need to get right with him. And we're fragmented in the sense that we're sinners, that we're not complete, we're not whole. But when we look to God's word, it says we're transformed from glory to glory. You see, we're made in his image, and when we fell away from him and we became shattered, that shattered visage, visage is renewed and recreated in the image of Christ by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, by the sanctifying power of the Word, which is sharper than a two-edged sword, by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit as we look to the Lord and through what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and He brings, brings wholeness to us. What they're doing is they're getting away from the pure, beautiful Word of God which shows his perfection and my sinfulness and my need to be sanctified. And they turn it around to where you're getting away from the scripture and you're getting a couple of divine editors and people that will bring you through guided imagery and visualization. And what happens, you, you get away from the true Jesus because in their healing, uh, what they do is they don't get you in touch with the true Jesus. They'll say, okay, close your eyes now and picture Jesus coming to you. And they might say he has blonde hair or they might say he has dark hair, and picture his eyes being brown, and, and he reaches out his hand to you, and he wants to, and then you talk to him, and they start getting you into this conversation with a, and by the way, one of the fastest ways to pick up a demon is through visualization. We're not called to visualize God. Why? Because it's a form of idolatry. When you, the Bible forbids the worship of idols, and when you worship an idol, you fall down before that idol. Well, guess what? If you commit adultery with a woman, 
It's one thing to do it physically, but someone could do that sexually in their mind by visualizing her. It's still sin. So if I visualize, if I make an idol of Jesus and bow down and worship it, that's idolatry. If I make a vi- an, uh, if I make if I visualize Jesus and begin to worship him, it's idolatry again. And what happens? These entities can become very al- these these images can become very alive, and that's how spirit when when uh, in new, the New Age movement. When they want you to pick up a spirit guide, they use guided imagery, they use visualization. Yeah. So what's happening is they're encountering a different Jesus, and this Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. He's a hostile Jesus because they're demonic entities when they often manifest, or the, 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 you know, they begin to manipulate. Let's say no demon shows up, and God somehow spared that person from who's getting into really occult practices. What they can do is because they want to believe that they're right, and God's been wrong in some way, they can imagine this Jesus into being imperfect. And he's, I'm right, you're really the one that needs forgiveness. You need to ask me for forgiveness. And all of a sudden, they have a, this isn't, that's why I'm saying with regard to Bethel, we're talking about receiving a different spirit. We're talking about a, a different gospel. We're talking about a different Jesus so often because they're encountering a different Jesus than is revealed in Scripture. Second Corinthians 11 warns about that. And again, one of the thing that, things that breaks my heart about this, when you think it through, is when you want William Branham's mantle, you're not talking about how he needs forgiveness from you. When you're going to these Catherine Coleman or Amy McPherson's or someone's grave and you're laying on it and sucking up their power or you're calling on an angel, you're not asking, saying they need forgiveness. They seem to be all super cool. It's just the God that created you that needs forgiveness. I mean, this is diabolical, satanic when you think about it. To the core, it just upends everything and it's absolutely heartbreaking when you think it through. Yeah, and that's one of the things. If if this is what you're being led to when you are praying, then the question is really, who are you praying to? And we supply two different witnesses right there from that minute, from, you know, that associated with the Bethel ministry. And as far as does God need to be forgiven, listen to this. Ezekiel 18, 29 uh, by the way, I just, it's, it's blasphemy to say that. Yeah, I don't even want to say it. That's just blasphemy. Asking the question it's, seems it's ridiculous. It's like blasphemous, yeah. man. Because to say that God, because you're, it's just ridiculous. Ezekiel 18, 29. But the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not right. That's what Bethel is saying, at least through their counseling ministry. Are my ways not right, O house of Israel? It is, is it not your ways that are not right? So we can get that confused on a very fleshly level, and the Lord warns us again, says, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus says, you therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we try to move to become more like the Lord and, and, and become perfect eventually, and we will when the Lord returns. Right now it says, you know, uh, that we purify ourselves, those that have the hope of Christ coming, as he is pure, we're becoming more and more like him. And then when he comes, that we will be perfected. Psalm 1830 says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. I love James, because uh, Chad, when we were off the air, you know, you were talking about how, can you imagine Job, you know, yeah. going up to the Lord and saying, you know, you, you know, you need to be forgiven or what have you. How ridiculous, because the Lord says, you know, where were you when I made, you know, and so that forth. That was his answer. That, yeah, <laughs> and Job put his hand over his mouth. He never even uttered that God would have some, yeah. how have sin, you know. And God, the Lord says to him, will you justify yourself by condemning me? We, we have to watch that. And that's, that's a fleshly demonic impulse that the enemy would love to give us. But when you have a ministry in the name of Jesus sanctifying wicked thoughts, it's very, very dangerous. James 1, 13 and 17. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of change or due to change. He doesn't change. He's perfect. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's perfectly holy. He, God never, ever, we say this, he never, ever says, oops, I made a mistake. He's perfect. So there's a lot of diabolical forces in the world. There's a lot of fallen human forces. There's a lot of sin. But man, he's the only one you can turn to. Yeah, amen. And you know, it's really interesting when you see those things and that they visualize that they're forgiving God for this terrible thing that took place in their life. It's really heartbreaking to think that instead of coming to a place where you say, wait, I need to repent of what I viewed God as, the idol that I had made of God and this viewpoint that I had, I need to repent of my viewpoint of who God is. That's literally what repent means to have that change of heart, change of mind, metanoia. We want to have that. It's 
Well, I was kind of right because I need to forgive God and then think you can get away with it by calling it some metaphorical thing or, well, it was the body of Christ that was doing it, so it was Christ doing it. It's, it's nonsense. It's nowhere found in Scripture. And it's heartbreaking because that's what we're talking about is where are you getting these answers? What, what and, and when we look at Bethel as a whole and we think about how their tentacles have gone out to the whole world, yeah, we crazy. think about this and... We're going to be bringing up now as we move forward in it this. It gets crazier as we go. Yeah, and, and when we talk about music, we're not even getting there. Just think about this. As we go through what's called the, another aspect of Sozo, which was started by Teresa Liebscher, one of the things that it's called, or the name of it, is the Shabar Ministry of Sozo. Mm -hmm. And they take that word from Isaiah 61. It's a Hebrew word where it says that he would heal the broken Mm -hmm. And Jesus quotes this and says, this is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus is this Shabar ministry. Jesus is this person bringing out this fragmentation problem. In fact, the founder, Teresa Liebscher, actually stated this. She said, Shabar is a ministry to what we call fragmented people. Now, I want you to remember, because Joe's mentioned fragmentation, fragmented people over and over again already. And what I wanted to talk about is the tentacles and the fact that how this is being used. Just as you heard a woman being led in sozo prayer for giving God, then hearing it from the pulpit from a pastor, a youth pastor at Bethel. So when we hear about this Shabar ministry and this broken hearted and these fragmented people and how they need to be putting these pieces back together, I want you to see how this is infiltrated. Maybe your church Maybe you're at a church that's playing Bethel on Sundays and we could talk a little bit about what does it mean even to be a worship leader? Is it simply that you play music for people or are you, is there something that you might be teaching? Yeah, you absolutely are teaching, man, because uh, if anybody speaks or sings, let it be according to the oracles of God. And King David talks about when in Psalm 40, I waited. When he waited, he wanted to be delivered from the pit. And the Lord puts him on solid ground and he puts a new song in his mouth. And it says that the heathen may hear it and be converted. You know, we're, we're, the Bible says sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Teaching one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So we're teaching, we're supposed to be teaching the psalms. You know, hymns, spiritual songs that are reflective of God's truth to give God glory. What happens is with a lot of the Bethel music, uh, and some of it's going to be scriptural because some of the things are, they're not, it's not going to be all poison because if it's all poison, no one would buy into it, you know? But what's going to happen is uh, there's a lot of times it's going to be like one of their songs, Calling Angels, things that are going to deviate from the path and deviate from the pure stream of, of God's Word. So uh, we have to make sure that when worship leaders need to make sure that they're in the Word, that they're prayerful, that they're cautious, and that they write that, and they pray, and they seek the Lord, and they write according to the Word of God. And then you have, you know, like so many of Charles Wesley's and so many of the great songs that came with the true revivals in the past Amen, yeah. uh, that are just soaked in the Word of God and God's character. And uh, you have songs based on Sozo or whatever, uh, or statements made by these people that are leaders. You're going to be hearing things about God's not perfect. God needs to be forgiven. That's not the biblical God. Yeah, one of the things when it comes to having church leadership and having people leading worship and doing these things inside of your churches, you should probably be paying attention to their social media imprint, the things that they're posting. And one of the leaders there that was at Bethel, Amanda Lindsay Cook, actually quoted this. And I want to read it, and then I'll tell you who it's from, because I found it quite interesting. And even right now, guys, right now, if you go to Amanda Lindsay Cook's Twitter page, this is still up there. She has over 24,000 people that she's teaching this as inspirational. Quote, your water, we're the millstone. Your wind, we're the dust blown up into shapes. Your spirit, we're the opening and closing of our hands. You're the clarity, we're the language that tries to say it. Your joy, we're all different kinds of laughing. First of all, it sounds like nonsense. And of course it sounds like Nostens because it's quote, and she puts the person who she's attributing, Rumi, which, what is, who is Rumi? Oh, Rumi is a Sufi mystic. And if you know nothing about Sufism, know that it is the mystical branch of Islam. We're talking about, you could go from, we could talk about, hey, the, that's the mystical branch of Christianity. We'd probably put Bethel in that camp. Yeah, this is the mystical branch of Islam 
Be you, promoted right there. Should we be promoting and posting She's promoting uh, paganism. And it's interesting because uh, when you talk about this idea about forgiving God, you talk about, you're getting these different versions of God. Now God is, because in Agnes Stanford, who we'll get to I'm sure in a minute, who is basically the mother of inner healing, so-called Christian inner healing, she taught that everybody's part of God. You know that we're all part of God, which is you know pantheism and or panentheism, depending on how you know someone uh, uh, understands that. But it's interesting because if Christ was not perfect, guess what? We're sin we're dead in our Amen. sins because the sacrifice wouldn't have taken. You know, and if God is everything, and we're part of God, then God's a sinner because we're sinners. And you can see how that would go together. And they'd say, well, Jesus is sinner because we're part of him. It's just, it's all ridiculous because it's all these one lie put upon another lie. But in Sufism, it, it fits with her view of inner healing. And because it's all in the mystical dream experiences and interpreting your dreams and how you see things and touchy-feely. Uh, but it's a form of Islam, you know. And it's interesting because she's trying to bridge the gap between paganism, which is what's happening in uh, Bethel. There's so many New Age teachings that have come in. In fact, uh, you know, Bill Johnson and some of the other leaders there have talked about how, well, we're basically taking it back from the New Age. They'll acknowledge a lot of this is the New Age movement, but they kind of stole it from us. When really it's not in the Bible what they're teaching, and they're getting it from the occult. New Age is basically occult. They're bringing it from the occult. And a lot of this inner healing is based on uh, Jungian psychology, psychotherapy, and so forth. And he was a protege of Sigmund Freud's, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, a little bit. But uh, it's absolutely amazing because this isn't the purpose of biblical ministry is not to go into a bunch of, it's to get away from the occult. These are the things that the Lord delivered us from, you know? You know, it's really interesting. And one of the things that I, I go through when, I, when I'm looking at these things, it breaks my heart. I, I feel bad because it says that they are deceived and they deceive others. They're, they're deceived yeah. themselves and they're deceiving others. And it breaks my heart because a lot of times people are placed in these positions. And just as you heard from Bill Johnson himself, he placed people in positions and demands them to be false prophets. And then after demanding them to be false prophets, he yeah. lifts them up. And when people are lifted up into positions they aren't supposed to be in, one warning of that about new converts not being elders, not put into those positions, is that they will be puffed up and fall under the same condemnation as Satan. And we're going to be listening to a clip here. And one of the things I wanted you to, to hear, one of the things I want you to see, one, in all honesty, when I see Amanda Lindsay Cook, it breaks my heart. I, I, I look at her, I see somebody that does look fragmented, mm -hmm. that does look brokenhearted, and it hurts my heart. And I know there's other people that are involved with Bethel, or maybe you listen to their music, or maybe you're involved in the teachings, or maybe you're involved in Bethel, you're up there in Reading right now. And the fact is, you're brokenhearted. And what they're offering will not mend. It will not fix it. These are Band-Aids, they're demonic Band-Aids a lot of times, on bullet wounds. And what you wanna do is take a look at this and look at it objectively. Test what we're saying with the scriptures. Do you really believe that the Holy Spirit is leading the worship leaders at Bethel to quote Sufi mystics? I mean, can you honestly, even for a second, believe that somebody, and they still have it up. It's still up there with comments yeah. about it. This is part of the ecumenical movement whereby we just kind of reach our tentacles beyond Christianity into the other religions and we affirm paganism. In fact, this has been going on. Remember, we've got a video called The Submerging Church that it, it was instrumental in killing the Submerging Church for a while as far as them using that title Amen. or the Emerging yeah. Church movement. And it's interesting because Anthony Campolo is one of the spiritual leaders of that movement. Listen to what he says about joining Sufism with Christianity and becoming one to bring the world together. A theology of mysticism provides some hope for common ground between Christianity and Islam. Both religions have within their histories examples of ecstatic union with God, which seem at odds with their own spiritual traditions, but have much in common with each other. So keep in mind, Islam denies that Jesus is the Son of God, denies that he died for our sins, yet that he's teaching that through Sufism they get unity with God, which is a lie. I think Campolo is a heretic. He's teaching that we should branch with them and unite mysticism. So when we see the resurgence of a very anti-Christian mystical aspect of Christianity, when we talk about mystical, I'm talking about occultic. I'm not talking about experiencing genuinely the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and walking in the power of the Spirit and overcoming sin. When you're talking about that burgeoning, that growing, and you have mysticism growing and paganism in the New Age movement, in the secular world, it's called the New Age movement, right? This is all coalescing, coming together, and it's gonna be very strong when the Antichrist reveals is revealed because 
The Bible talks about the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. And the spirit of Antichrist is at work at Bethel in the guise of a supernatural form of Christianity, not the supernatural form we read about the Bible, but uh, a, a counterfeit a revival. Counterfeit. And it's interesting because maybe you haven't heard of, of Tony Campolo, but guess what? Brian McLaren, who was also one of the leaders of the Emerging Church Movement, which has been stomped out a lot, said this not long after Submerging Church came out, our, our video on that subject, and he said that basically they're still part of the pie, you just don't understand what ingredients they are. Yeah. Because they've seeped in unnoticed oh, yeah. and crept in, and that's exactly what's going on here. And that's what that's what's going on with ecumenism, ecumenism emergent church, and now we just have it moving and, and swirling away because it's the same old Satan. And the heartbreaking thing is, as we look, and you're gonna hear from Amanda Lindsay Cook, see how Sozo Prayer, she's enacting it. So when we're talking about how demonic this is, and this is satanic, guys, this isn't something of the Holy Spirit, pay attention to how she writes her songs and now how it affects, and maybe how it is affecting you. And so for, for me, writing has become a spiritual practice of remembrance. It's become a spiritual practice of, of actually starting to track with the pieces like breadcrumbs that bring me back to those little moments when I became fragmented, or I started um, performing for something that was my birthright. Please hear the difference for me. Performance arts are not a problem. Whenever I use the, when we use the term performing for something for our birthright, it's just, it's an attitude towards life we're talking about. Not that performing in and of itself is bad. Does that make sense? Um, so for me, I, I have found that with writing, <clears throat> writing just simply became more of a necessity um, for my own spiritual practice of, of finding the breadcrumbs back to the beginning and remembering the things that I had forgotten. It's a way of salvation, perhaps, because that's part of our salvation. Now notice there, the writing, the music. This is right now, that video clip can be found on Bethel's Music U. You can find it and look. And this is how they're telling people to write music. Get involved with Bethel. Get involved with Sozo. The same thing that's telling people to forgive God for their sins. Get involved with Sozo, which we're going to get to what I believe may be the most demonic part of this whole thing and where a lot of this lines up. But when it comes to it, you can hear her saying that fragmented, those pieces. You hear those certain buzzwords that have to do with Sozo prayer, that have to do with Shabar, that has to do with this fragmenting they talk about, and that is what is being written on paper. That's what be, is being put on guitar and sung and then coming into your churches, and it's demonic. Do you think that we should even be thinking about having this stuff in our churches as a pastor? No, absolutely not, because they're not giving... I mean, it's interesting. She calls it at the end of that... Salvation. That quote, a way of salvation. Uh, yeah. right? And I think it's interesting, a way of salvation, as though there's more than one way of salvation. In fact, it's interesting when the demon possessed woman in Acts chapter 16 was following Paul and Silas, and she was following them for quite some time, and they finally turned around and cast a demon out of her. And uh, she was saying, hey, these guys proclaim, you know, the most high God, which to a lot of the Greco Romans would be thinking of Zeus, you know, and they preach a way of salvation. In the Greek, there's no definite article, ho or ha, of salvation, you know, the way of salvation. It's just a way, it's just left alone. There's no definite article. So it would be understood uh, typically as a way of salvation. And there's a demon using her. She tells fortunes. She, you know, which is a very similar, by the way, to what happens. We're gonna get that in the next episode. Uh, the last episode, we're talking about their prophesying and their supernatural school of ministry and what's going on there and how there's a lot of witchcraft and things of that nature that are affirmed over there. But it's interesting that you have this fortune teller who's a prophetess. Uh, finally, Paul turns around and casts this demon out of her. And by the way, they get flogged, Paul and Silas, because they, the, the, the businessmen who were running her and using her, pimping her out, spiritually speaking, had them flogged because they lost their ability to make money because she was actually, you know, had, like, like, like Bethel, maybe a few percent success rate. She was right more often than not, maybe, who knows, because uh, she was, had a demon in her. And they cast this demon out of her, but she was preaching by the power of the demon, a way of salvation through an alternate form of maybe an amalgamation or a synthesis between Christianity and paganism. Because Satan knew when the gospel was being preached, the power of the gospel was being shared, people were being saved left and right. And what does he try to do? He tries to always bring Jesus as one of the persons in his pantheon rather than having the true Jesus. And within 
Bethel, what you see is Jesus becomes, we've, we're just, in this session, we're finding out he's actually kind of like us. He's less than perfect. He's a sinner. He's, he needs to be forgiven by Bill us. Bill Johnson's been said he's been born, he was born again as well. Yeah, born again. Jesus yeah, we, had, we did not even get into We're faith heresy, right? His, uh, his so it's just actually yeah. mind boggling how deep this actually goes. And like I said, I wanted to, to talk a little bit and not only read from you, and this is actually the article on Sozo Prayer, on the Christian Post that we already quoted from, but it actually talks about the divine or memory editing yeah. that takes place. And I'm going to read straight from it, and then what I want to do is play a clip for you of the same woman that we played earlier, talked about forgiving Father God. I want to play a clip for you showing where she institutes this memory editing practically, so you guys can read it, understand it, see it, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Divine editing. Divine editing has also been linked to Dr. Iko Hormon in relation to the Sozo prayer. If your childhood lacked nurturing, invite your Heavenly Father to fill in the voids created by lack of nurturing. He will, quote, edit your memories, both edit out painful memories and edit in his nurturing. Hormon's website describes, the idea was first associated with Sigmund Freud, though without the divine aspect. American Christian writer Agnes Sanford, which we'll dig into right after, is responsible for teaching the Christian method of, quote, inner healing. Now, I want you to see how this has been used. And remember, this is in the context of, once again, a sozo prayer. God showed me through a series of pictures that I had in my head during the sozo that he really was my father. And um, the last picture that he showed me was of me when I was about 16 and I was uh, standing at the church that we used to go to on Father's Day and I had on this white corsage. And I went to a very traditional, very Southern church and you wore white corsages when your father had passed away on Father's Day. And as I'm in my head in, in that memory and I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it in my mind, um, the white corsage, it turned red. And so that was just amazing to me. It was God's way of saying that I am your father and I am alive and well and I'm taking care of you. So you see, that is the practical way that they memory edit. That is her describing her memory edit from a flower that was white to a flower that was red, just as we just described in writing. So Joe, this inner healing, Agnes Sanford, he's an American Christian writer. This seems biblical, right? Uh, she has, I mean, she's basically the mother of... Uh, she, sorry. Yeah, she's, she's the mother of basically uh, so-called Christian inner healing. Uh, and it's Sanford without the D, S-A-N-F-O-R-D. I mentioned that because she had a couple, the most prominent inner healing editors for some time were John and Paula Sanford with a D, not related to her. And they, they called her, yes, she's the forerunner of this whole movement, the inner healing movement. And... Uh, basically what happens, as you can see, again, it gets back into, you know, Jesus going with you, or you got this guided imagery of the Father or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, according to Sozo, pick the one who you want to guide you, and you go through this labyrinth of your past experiences, and uh, they can change the reality. So instead of facing reality and say, this really did happen to me, okay, and I need to forgive whoever, at the hands of whoever, hurt me in whatever way, or I need to repent of. See, we can't go and literally change our past, but we have really, because the past is the past, it's there. We can be forgiven of our past through the blood of Christ, and we can deal with issues relating to people that are still alive that might have hurt us in the past, or we may have hurt. If somebody has sinned against us and they're professed to be a Christian, Jesus said to go to them privately and confront them with their sin. If they refuse to repent, bring one or two more. If they still refuse, then bring it before the church. Let's say it's not somebody that has sinned against us, but we've hurt them. Jesus said, when, if you've hurt someone, or Jesus said, if someone has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go and make amends with them and so forth and make it right. So whether we've been the perpetrator or somebody else has, Jesus gives us, we have the word of Christ, man. We, we, that's why we don't need to go beyond what's written because he is more than sufficient. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, he says in his word. And that's one of the sad things here. They diminish the power of Christ. He even needs to be forgiven. They diminish the power of his word. We need sozo and all these weird ministries, you know, to make up where God lacks. Uh, and what, but when you look at the scripture, the scripture says that, that his word is sufficient 
you know, to meet all of our needs and to train us in righteousness that we may be sufficient or adequate before God. And all scripture is inspired by God and so forth. And he gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. So it's important that we understand what's happening here is the sozo practitioner becomes the savior. So Chad, you have these inner hurts that you're really dealing with. Instead of saying, hey, have you forgiven? Because you won't be forgiven, Jesus said, if you refuse to forgive. Or instead of saying, hey, you know what? You need to make it right with that person because you're, you're dealing with some guilt and, and, you're in, and you know deep down that you've got these, you know, you're at odds with this person. Biblical counseling. Instead of that, guess what? Jesus will come in and I'll help you and help him guide you and help you accept his guidance or the Holy Spirit or the Father. And they're going to help you deal with these past hurts, you know? And, and by the way, you might find out that you have to forgive Jesus because he's not, he's not all that, you know? You could trust me, your counselor, because I'm really the savior, and I might show you that Jesus isn't all that, because we just heard from two of their leaders that they had to forgive Father God when I had to forgive Jesus. And this is how demonic this gets. And it, it is demonic at its heart, because guess what? Uh, Agnes Sanford, who they all acknowledge is the forerunner of soul movement, uh, she would integrate not Sufism, but Buddhism. She'd go to a Buddhist temple, and worship in a Buddhist temple. And it's interesting because guess what? She picked up a demon and as a professing Christian leader, right? And according to John uh, Sanford with the D and, and Paula, uh, she needed deliverance. And John Sanford cast this demon out of her, okay? So again, we're seeing with whether it's Branham, we're seeing all these connections with demons. These people are being used, many of them, by demonic forces to create a false form of Christianity to get us away from the simplicity of the truth again, which Paul says, I fear less by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, how is that you shall be his God? We just heard Velotin say, we're gods. And how did he do it? He says, I'm, I'm fearful, Paul says, that as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds might be corrupted from your simple devotion to Christ. His word, Jesus, we love you, Lord, and follow him. And thank you so much for your shed blood. And thank you for your word, which is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path, the prophetic word. And without it, we go astray. Praise you, Jesus, knowing Jesus. And all of a sudden, you get led astray from that simple devotion to Christ and the cross, the atonement, his resurrection, the gospel. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you're following all this highfalutin stuff that claims to be so deep and so spiritual. And guess what? All of a sudden, you're just having a hard time with Jesus because, you know, and, and you're going to forgive him. And all of a sudden, everything is just whacked. And you're following a sozo teaching, which is based on the teachings of a admittedly demon-possessed woman who said she felt she got possessed because of her worshiping at a Buddhist temple. Well, with all that, I mean, <laughs> you, I mean honestly, when, when it comes to this, and he, here's the thing. A lot of you, especially if you're from Bethel or you're from a movement or from a church that allows this into your church and maybe you've done sozo prayer, maybe you've led a sozo prayer, what I want to ask you to do is repent, to just, to just look at these things honestly, mm. objectively. And when we say objectively, we say by the objective standard, by God's word. What does God's word say? You're always going to be told about your feelings. And you're always going to be told, well, what about this and this anointing and this and all, the, all this jargon that sounds like it may be biblical, but when you look in context, it never is. So I want to encourage you right now, if you're involved in this, it's demonic. Get out. Amen. Run. As we talked about earlier, don't walk. Run to the nearest exit and run. And his name the, is Jesus. He's the exit. His and name is the Jesus. The true Jesus, the biblical Jesus. Run into the arms of Jesus and leave Sozo far far behind. Amen. As you've clearly seen, Sozo is something that you do not want your church involved in. And if you noticed very clearly that the musical lyrics that are coming through through this prayer are from a totally other spirit. So you need to ask yourself, should I continue to listen to and meditate on songs and lyrics that are coming through this line of meditation? As we continue this series, we're going to see not only is this of another spirit, but we're going to get some real details as to what this spirit actually manifests as.